lecture by Professor Peter Schultz. Um, you know he's an important personality in science, but I wear a suit and I feel overly fragile. Can you introduce him? The other reason I've decided to try and introduce him again after doing it yesterday is because I didn't quite make it to the one third of the CV, but you know, complete the job today. Peter, yesterday, was referred to me as a phenomenon, and his lecture phenomenal. And I'm sure you'll be surprised that you know, that wasn't you know, all that he does. That's a subtraction. He's going to tell you a little bit about what he's done with stem cells today. Peter started as an undergraduate in 1970, finished as an undergraduate at Great Caltech in 1979, got his PhD with Peter Durbin, working on small molecules that target DNA. Um, in 84, and then after that, it's just incredible and humbling to see the CV. In two years, he went from assistant professor to associate professor, three years to professor. A couple of years after that, he was a Howard Hughes a few years after that, few, I mean, two years after that, at the same time, actually. By the age of 38, he was a member of the Academy, a rare distinction, he's also a member of the Institute of Medicine at the National Academy, the undergraduate awards, graduate awards, postgraduate awards. It's, I mean, I don't know what's left. <laughs> I feel bad for competing for these awards at the same time. <laughs> the Searle Scholarship, Dreyfus, Lilies, Lowe, etc. It goes on Bader, Cook. Um, ending with, of course, I mean, the Wolf Prize, Chair Institute of the Arts, did that lecture. But the most important lecture, I think, it ends, the CV ends on this one. It says, Harry Steenbach lecture, University of Wisconsin, 2008. So that must be the crowning. <laughs> <laughs> right. And uh, not to put it out, Harry Steenbach lectures in the past years have gone on. If they haven't already won another the prize, they've gone on to win one. The example, of course, is Kurt Woodrick, who gave this talk, and a week later won the, won the prize. So I think you made the right choice. <laughs> <laughs> I can continue, I mean, I, you know, I think I'm kidding. Here's a list of all the awards. <laughs> it just goes on, single line, all the way down to here. Um, but, you know, I'll stop here, and let me give you the, you know, justification for where all the tax dollars are going. Doing today is April 15th. <laughs> Um, thanks, I think. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, it's really been fun being here. It's just terrific talking to everybody, um, faculty and grad students and both sides. It's really exciting. It's your brain going. Um, what I kind of do today is um, talk about kind of the flip side of what I was talking about uh, yesterday. As I said, we um, basically at Harvard Synthetic Chemists, we make molecules. And our interest is in making molecules um, not with defined structures, but functions, either chemical, biological, or physical. And as I said, um, chemists aren't very good at that. So in general, what we do is take lessons from nature um, and use biological strategies and even biological molecules to help us as chemists create interesting new molecular structures and assemblies. And yesterday, I talked about complex molecular structures and assemblies in the context of living organisms and altering their genetic code. Today I want to go to the other end of the spectrum and talk about small molecules, okay, molecules that are 500 molecules away. And how do we find interesting biologically active small molecules that you know, the biologists might think are interesting. Um, so that's where we're going to start today. Um, I actually fell asleep before I finished the talk last night, so we'll see how this goes, okay? But, um, so, how do we find interesting small molecules in terms of uh, molecules that do interesting things from a biologist's perspective? Well, one way is to take a defined uh, target and actually branch, attempt to rationally design a molecule that binds and blocks it. Um, and that's not so easy to do. It takes entire teams of medicinal chemists to do that. We take a different approach, and that's a biologically inspired approach, um, and that's really to make large collections of small molecules and simply look for those of the most interesting properties. 
and then work backwards. It's the same way the immune system works in the lab of the recognition. If you want to make an antibody that recognizes a ligand, you make a billion antibodies, okay, based on, you know, DDJ rearrangements and recombination. And then you find one that works and fine tune it through affinity maturation. Well, that's exactly what we're going to do. Instead of assembling molecules and sets in terms of gene segments, variable joint and diversity, we break down small molecules in terms of building blocks. So if you take a benzodiazepine, you can break it down into three sets of building blocks. They are genes, they're small molecular entities. And if you assemble 100 of these, 100 of these, and 100 of these, you'll get a million molecules. Same way the immune system works, okay? So that's the strategy. It's called combinatorial chemistry. A lot of people practice it now. We've actually developed um, at Scripps, um, Matt Gray, Shunbing, Shu Wu, and others have developed some really pretty simple chemistry for making very diverse chemical scaffolds where we actually use heterocycles themselves that you see in drug-like substances as pieces of the building blocks. So we can create huge libraries of compounds and our constraints are these should actually look like molecules that are known to bind to biological receptors. Um, and they should be easy to make because once you find an interesting small molecule, this, you know, that's not where the story ends. You have to improve its affinity and selectivity if you want to do anything with it in general. So you really need straightforward synthetic routes. Otherwise, you, every molecule you find, you're going to need five chemists. Um, to, to optimize it. So we built libraries around all kinds of molecules that actually are known to interact and modulate the activities of biological molecules, many of which are in four by six. And in Scripps, we probably have a collection of about 100,000 compounds. At GNF, we built a collection of two and a half million compounds. So we actually have relatively large collections. And the challenge then is when we realized that it would take now, say, two and a half million molecules, big pharma, if they're going to screen two and a half million molecules, they budget a million dollars you know, to do the screen. So that presented a problem for us <laughs> um, because, you know, we could have run two screens and run out of money, okay? So what we did is we said, well, if you really want to use this as a research tool, okay, um, to find interesting new molecules, you really need to do something now about the cost of doing experiments as well. Otherwise you can't do the experiments. So um, at GNF we hired um, a group of engineers, actually my own college roommate at Caltech was the person who built the first uh, electronic transmission, um, which was in a Saturn car and I decided that most things you build in biotech, you publish in science and then they break down. Um, the cars have to drive 120,000 miles, okay? So we hired uh, automotive engineers, and we really built high-throughput cell-based screening methodology. Um, and this system, we can screen the entire collection in a day, for two days. Um, it costs pennies per molecule. Um, the entire screen now, instead of costing a million dollars, costs 30000 or $20,000, okay? So almost a 50-fold reduction in cost. Um, in the molecule collections, um, we can buy a micromolar molecule and it will last for 10 years. So it becomes very simple to make quantities of molecules to build huge collections. Um, and moreover, we build imaging capabilities that allow us to screen in almost any format, including high content imaging. So now that we have this collection of molecules that are diverse but simple to make, okay, and we have the ability to run screens in, in a research mode, we decided in my Scripps lab, what I'm going to talk about mostly is work done in Scripps, um, is we've decided to run a whole series of screens to look for interesting molecules, okay? Um, and so, for instance, you can run screens where you target a particular protein. So one of the proteins we were interested in, in fact, worked with a group of GNF on, is a translocated kinase called NMPALK which is one of these fusion events that leads to constitutive activity and a signaling kinase that leads to cancer. At first, this translocation was identified 
uh, and you know, classic orange cell lymphomas. Um, now, all of a sudden, it's found in lung cancers, ovarian cancers, so it's a huge um, population of potential patients. So, in this case, what we wanted to do was a cell-based screen to find inhibitors of this translocated kinase. And so you can do a very simple, generate a very simple construct where you turn this into a proliferative screen by taking these BAF3 um, cells and actually making their proliferation dependent on the activity of this kinase. And this you can do, it's quite commonly done now. And so then you can screen these collections of molecules, and here we found a molecule that's active at about IC50 of about 5 nanomolar. And if you actually put it into a mouse model of an MPALK, you actually get um, remission, okay? I mean, this is actually really impressive. So 10 mg per keg in these um, rodents, um, the tumor is ablated. So actually, this is probably going to go into people in the next um, 12 months, would be my guess. So, um, you can do target-based screens. You can then begin to generalize these. So you can actually take tyrosine kinases and make them constitutively active because it's known in, in certain fusions, um, patient-derived um, fusions, you have the teledimerization domain fused to the kinase domain that, again, leads to an activated translocated kinase. So what we said is, why don't we just take John Melnick, so why don't we just take this and begin to fuse it to every tyrosine kinase and it turns out that worked. So he actually um, has made, we've made fusions of all, of roughly 80 human tyrosine kinases. And so we have all of these in cell-based um, screening mode, and then we have a collection of our, our kinase-selected small molecule scaffold. So the question was, how do we screen all those? So, Jeremy Caldwell um, at GNF and, and the engineering group and Dan Sykes and others got together and actually built an automated system now that not only screens, it will take 200 cell lines and propagate them in an automated way. So it splits them, changes media, spins them down, resuspends them, plates them out, and adds all the compounds. And so in a single experiment, you can actually now, if you're looking for interesting kinases, and this first one, we took 42 tyrosine kinases in a single experiment assay, only it's 5,000 compounds, and generated about a million and a half data points. So the kinds of information you now get by doing all of the tyrosine kinases, and now we're doing a large number of orphan GPCRs and so forth the same way, is you know, you've seen these um, kinome um, branch charts. Well, now you can actually take the kinome and um, begin to segment it um, based on reactivities of kinases or inhibitory activities, the degree of inhibition of these kinases by specific molecules in your screening collection. So what you wind up doing is clustering these kinases based on their ability to be inhibited with a specific chemical scaffold. And then what you wind up seeing is, oh, if I have an inhibitor by ALK, it should in inhibit um, IGFR too. So, oh, if I want to make an IGFR inhibitor, let's use an inhibit molecule that hits ALK and so forth and so on. So you can just march through your collection of kinase inhibitors and go from one kinase to another to another and figure out start points. And then you can actually go into the literature, and here's Gleevec. GNF is funded by Novartis. So you can see this is actually quite selective, okay? <laughs> it is BCR able, okay, kit and PPF. The Bristol Myers Squibb competitor compound, okay, it's everything, okay. So um, this is actually a BCR able inhibitor too. But the, the the real point of this is actually you could also use this molecule as a start point to inhibit LAN or you know efferin D1 or whatever you want. So again, you can be able to go from single specific target based screens to families of proteins to generate small molecules that can be useful tools and potentially useful drugs. But then, the research part of this is really then going in and treating basically the cell as a black box and doing an unbiased cell-based screen. And you can screen for molecules that affect the heat range of cellular processes, from proliferation to differentiation, apoptosis, and so on and so on. 
based on just the activity in the cell, the phenotype of the cell or a reported based assay. So we can look at morphology, proliferation, we can look at mitochondria, we can look at mitochondria segmenting, we can look at mitotic spindles. Um, and you have the advantage here now is you're treating the cell with a small molecule and you're interrogating thousands of proteins and clay acids at a time. So what you're now doing is not looking for your keys under the lamppost, you're actually interrogating the whole cell to try and find some interesting thing. Now we'll see that it's actually hard to do this with small molecules. So if you want to find novel genes, you probably want to screen S I and C D N A libraries. Okay? Um, it's far simpler than the deconvolution, it's far more straightforward. Um, in the case of small molecules, the advantage there is if we find a small molecule that does something interesting, we can take it into pharmacological models in DEVO and test those sometimes more easily. Okay? So if you're doing this with small molecules, I think ultimately your motivation ought to be in DEVO models. So we're running many cell-based screens and looking at various genetic and orphan diseases and neglected diseases and so forth and so on. Um, um, but I just want to tell you about a subset of those screens today that um, came out of, um, as I was thinking, where should we go with this kind of methodology and where is big pharma not and so forth and so on. I was realizing I was getting older. So I thought, well, I have to do something that's relevant to me as a person. <laughs> So we started thinking about regeneration, okay, and you know, can we make body parts? Because I'm pretty soon gonna need body parts. So, you know, and I always, you know, as a chemist, biology is kind of really fascinating. So if you cut, you know, the tail off a new, it grows back. If you cut your finger off, you have no finger. Okay? Why? Why can't it grow organs and body parts and that's not? So we got really intrigued by this, and we said, well, maybe we can take a small molecule approach towards this problem um, and learn something that's complementary to what's going on in the biology world and sense of biology world. And maybe we can find small molecules that affect these processes of differentiation, self renewal, and reprogramming. And maybe we can test hypotheses in vivo with these molecules, and maybe by learning how these molecules work, we'll actually gain some insights into processes. So that was a motivation. And so we really got into this not knowing um, anything about um, developmental biology. So um, we started out um, with more or less um, simpler systems. So the first thing we did was take an adult stem cell screen and we took um, MSC um, from mice and asked whether we could actually find molecules. Normally, as you all know, these um, differentiate into osteoblast chondrocytes or diposites. And we said, could we find molecules that would control the selective differentiation of MSCs and say they bone selectively or make chondrocytes? And so when you're screening large numbers of molecules, um, in general, the cost of the screen is very many. So you really want the first round pass to go from two and a half million molecules to 2,000, and then you can do almost any assay with 2,000. So if you want to look at osteoblasts, you look at alpha phosphatase. If you want to look at chondrocytes, the primary screen with a salicine blue. And we found molecules that affect both of these processes, and we'll selectively give osteoblasts and selectively give chondrocytes. And we actually are looking at optimizing these tests and rodent models um, with um, cartilage damage. But um, Xu Wu, who did this, um, as a first year grad student, isolated one molecule we call germorphamine. You can see we're somewhere between a chemical and a biological world. Because we, if we were biologists, we would have called this AKT or JAK or whatever, some three letter acronym that I don't know how anybody remembers these things, okay? If we were chemists, we would have called this the Schultz molecule, okay? Because um, chemists name things after themselves. Um, we actually call it a purine with a mean that morphs, so purine, so we can remember it. And it actually does differentiate MSCs to bone, and we confirm this um, with a secondary um, reporter-based assay. And then we actually carried out assays of morphology and with other bone-specific markers. 
And so the question was, how does this small molecule work? And so we began to carry out a lot of experiments, and this becomes a really challenging part when you have an active small molecule, is how do you figure out what it does? And in general, our approaches are either transfer profiling, um, affinity-based approaches, which are the most successful, or cDNA complementation experiments. Okay. Um, in this case, um, the RNA expression analysis um, gave the, 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 the clues when we actually did an analysis, a pathway analysis, we found that this molecule actually um, activated hedgehog signaling. And um, we showed that molecules that antagonize hedgehog signaling, such as cyclopamine, block the activity of the molecule. And in fact, um, Janet at Stanford subsequently showed in a competition experiment that this molecule actually binds and is a smooth agonist. Okay, so we started out with an unbiased cell based screen and actually hit on a major development agonist for a major development cold pathway, which said, well, maybe we will find interesting things here. So that got us kind of excited. And so we've subsequently gone in and set up screens to look for agonists and antagonists of hedgehog signaling, Wentz signaling, notch, and so forth and so on. And we have, again, we have some antagonists, you will, and his team should find the main antagonist of hedgehog uh, signaling that was shortly around the clinic. But one thing we looked at was agonist and antagonist of wind signaling, and we found this molecule. We set up um, uh, with Chishen and Shunding this synergist screen, so looking for small molecules that would be synergistic with wind. And the top flash reporter assay and found this molecule, and in the presence of 1,3A, um, the reporter is activated roughly 200 fold. And it not only works in cells, it actually um, is a potent wind synergist in xenophus. You see increased full of the, uh, partial axis duplication. You see um, a wavy uh, notochord phenotype in zebrafish. So it looks like it's actually a molecule that can be used in various simple or organistic models. And then the question is, how does this molecule work? And so in this case, um, we made affinity reagents, and we actually affinity purified this protein, this 45 kilodalton protein, that turned out to be ARF GAP. So it's kind of surprising because um, there aren't GAP inhibitors described. And is it an ARF GAP inhibitor? Well, ARF, is, as you know, is a, a, a GTPase, um, and the GTP bound form is off, and the GDP bound form is off. And ARF GAP is a GTP activating protein, so it catalyzes a GTP to GDP hydrolysis reaction. So it turns out if you inhibit this with this compound, um, QS11, you actually see the GTP bound form of ARF6 and ARF1. Uh, you can measure a direct interaction on the order of hundreds of nanomolar by Viacor. If you overexpress ARF GAP1, you block the synergistic effect of the molecule and propel name blocks the effect of the molecule. So this is really how the molecule is functioning. So what we think is we're doing is we're turning our fund, which is involved in protein trafficking and trafficking in cell, and that's activating, acting as a wind synergist by um, modulating either endocytosis of E. cadherin and beta catenin, or it could be affecting other um, proteins in, in the wind signaling pathway, for instance, trafficking of wentless outside of the cell, okay? And so we're not, we know it's working at this level and it's modulating the pathway, but the exact nature of this we don't know yet, although we now have assays in-house to look at trafficking of these proteins. So, we then decided to look at, begin to look at other cell types, so um, we got together with Rusty Gage and said, so, well, can we actually begin to do screens to look at neural stem cells? So um, we actually carried out a, a screen of neural stem cells isolated from adult rat hippocampus. And the screen was really to look for molecules that would selectively induce neurogenesis, okay? Whereas if you use retinoic acid, you induce um, relatively unspecific differentiation. So we found this molecule, KHS 101, um, which is um, pretty active um, in cell-based assays. It's about five micromolar in this case. Um, we optimized the properties of this molecule so that they would pass the blood-brain barrier. And we put these into um, rats. And we actually are beginning to see um, 
um, when we treat rats and do um, look at neurogenesis um, and proliferation, we're actually beginning to see the cage uh, S101, six makes per K, actually induces neurogenesis in, in the rat dentate gyrus. So it looks like now we're actually have a small molecule that appears to have activity in vivo, which is pretty neat. Um, we, we don't know how this molecule acts. We've done affinity-based experiments, and we have four um, proteins we've isolated that we're characterizing now and making a size for each one of those. Uh, we know that it does inhibit BMP4 induced astrocyte formation. We know it affects M4 signaling, but that's really all we know. So once we identify the molecular interactors, I think it will give more insights. Um, Heiko, who's done that work, is also beginning to look at glioblastoma derived stem cells. So he's isolated these cells and proliferated them. Um, and they're actually quite tumorigenic. And so he's carried out screens to look for molecules that will selectively induce apoptosis or differentiation of these glioblastoma derived stem cells. And he's found this class of molecules. And you can see this class of molecules induces apoptosis apparently selectively of these glioblastoma derived stem cells relative to other neural progenitor cells. So Sauersporin kills both relatively non-specifically as a control. And here you see at 6.2 micromolar levels, okay, um, we're actually sparing neural stem cells and killing these glioblastoma derived stem cells. So we're starting to move into this area now to look for things that might be useful to test um, the cancer stem cell hypothesis in vivo. So then we looked at other, so we're really kind of, as you can tell, in surveying mode as chemists to see what interesting things we can find and then collaborate. Um, so we then looked at hematopoietic stem cells, working, Tony Boitano did this, a postdoc in my lab, working with Mike Cook at GNF. And so the idea was to take HSCs, purified population of human HSCs, and then look at what we could control differentiation to. So look at bacteriocytes, erythrocytes, macrophages, and so forth. And also look at self renewal. And in this case, we actually found a molecule that induced differentiation of HSCs in the megakaryocytes. Okay, and you can see these molecules are pretty potent at one micromolar. Um, they make megakaryocytes in a dose dependent fashion. Um, and consistent with that, if you do a ploidy analysis, you see we're making, again, um, megakaryocytes with a small molecule at roughly the same concentrations. And so the question was, how does this molecule work? And in this case, we actually happened, when we ran this through our bank of kinase assays, we wound up having a molecule that inhibited the PDGFR. And so um, that's the activity of the molecule. It's a pretty potent inhibitor. Um, and likewise, we took anti-PDGF antibodies, an anti-PDGF-C antibody, and you can see it has the same activity as a small molecule in inducing megakaryocyte formation. So we can induce it with this antibody-specific, uh, ligand-specific antibody, and a small molecule with blocks or receptor. So it turns out PDGFR alpha is highly expressed in CMPs. And if you look, PDGF A and B are made by megakaryocytes and PDGF C by HSCs. So our current model is that you're actually, um, um, there's a negative feedback loop of PDGF being released by the HSCs and megakaryocytes that actually downregulates the differentiation of CMPs. And our PDGF alpha, our, our receptor alpha inhibitor is actually blocking activity of these molecules in the negative re regulation. So the neat thing here is these molecules should actually be synergistic with TPO. So they actually might be useful clinically for making <laughs> So now we turned our attention to embryonic stem cells, and we didn't know how to grow embryonic stem cells, so we started out with urine embryonic stem cells. Susanna Chen did this, collaborating with Shen Dang, who was a graduate student. Uh, sorry, this was done by Xu Wu um, in collaboration with Shen Dang. So what we did is we took, um, in this case, as our, for our high throughput screen, we, we used mouse EC cells. Um, and we used a reporter. We were asking whether we could differentiate um, urine ESCs into cardiomyocytes. And here we generated a reporter, a luciferase-based reporter, based on 
uh, Ang and F, um, Lucia Ferre's um, uh, reporter kind of stuff. We went through the collection and found this molecule, which again we characterize in a, set, a series of secondary assays based on markers and transcription factors and so, expression and so forth. Interestingly, if you take this molecule and treat R1 ESCs, you do get beating cardiomyocytes. So it's, it's kind of an interesting molecule. Um, again, there have been reports that this actually has activity in vivo, but we certainly haven't reproduced those reports. So we then began to look at um, Xiao Ten, began to look at differentiation of other cell types. So we really like to go from ES cells to endoderm to, say, hepatocytes or to beta cells. And so we carried out the first step of that, where we actually carried out a, 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 a screen looking at for SOX17 positive, SOX7 negative cells. And again, these you're using these markers, so the the actual technical details of running the screen in a cost-effective fashion become important. But we actually identified this molecule that selectively induces differentiation of definitive endoderm. Okay. It looks like a star of sworn analog, so we thought this was completely nonspecific, but it turns out when you run this through the entire human tyrosine kinome collection, it hits no kinase. So it's not acting as a kinase inhibitor. Um, again, we've just carried out affinity purification experiments and we're trying to deduce the proteins in, in bonds, and we should have those soon. But it, you are able to um, take this molecule, make definitive endoderm, and then differentiate those cells into albumin expressing hepatocytes. And this molecule does work um, in human embryonic stem cells, H1 cells, as well. So here we have an example of a molecule that crosses between human and mouse. And again, it's useful for selective differentiation of EFC. So then, so. Um, we're beginning to find molecules that induce selective differentiation, um, and we'd like to take some of those molecules into appropriate animal models for regeneration. And we next turned our attention to asking whether we could find self-renewing molecules. And so again, um, because uh, of our lack of, of expertise in the area, we started out, Susanna Chen started out with murine ESC cells and we look for molecules that would simply allow us to proliferate ESCs in an undifferentiated state. And so the screen is really simply using I4 GFP reporter and we look for green. And so we carried out a large screen and we found this molecule, um, SC1, that actually allows you, it's CC50 is about one micromole, and it allows you to actually expand ESCs in the absence of lift for feeder cells or what have you. That's how the screen was carried out without feed or lift. And so you can actually passage um, murine embryonic stem cells serially with this molecule. They maintain expression of ES um, uh, markers, nanogoc socks, um, they, um, and they retain the morphology of ES cells. You can then differentiate these into multiple cell types and they contribute to the germline. So this works well for mouse embryonic stem cells. It doesn't work for human embryonic stem cells, but we've just done the first round screen there and we've actually isolated a number of small molecules now that appear to work for human ES cells. So how does this molecule work? Well, this turned out to be kind of interesting. And so again, we carried out affinity experiments. So we make an active molecule and we make a dead molecule. So, and we do differential affinity experiments. And we found that the active molecule bound ERP1 and RASCAP. So you can purify RASCAP and ERP1 and measure direct binding. And it's on the order of 100 nanomol or so. So you can measure direct interaction. You can overexpress ERP1 and RASCAP and you aggregate the activity of the small molecules. Okay? And then you can go in and independently accomplish the same thing. So we can take another small molecule, um, a Park Davis compound that hits ERK, and we can actually take an SI against um, an SH against RAS gap. And in the presence of both of these, you recapitulate the self renal phenotype. So in this case, we serendipitously hit two targets for the small molecule, and it appears that both are required. And so here's what we have. Um, we're, we're blocking RAS gap, 
again, this is kind of surprising because there haven't been reports of this, and we're blocking ERK1, so we may be blocking differentiation signals at the same time as being telling cells to proliferate. Okay, that's the simple model. So then we said, well, this is an interesting approach. If we can do self renewal, let's go back to adult stem cells and ask whether there's an adult stem cell type that we really want to be able to, to propagate therapeutically. So we went back to this hematopoietic stem cell screen and we asked whether we could find molecules that promote HSC um, self renewal so, so we can expand HSCs in an undifferentiated state and then do a bone marrow transplant and they would actually differentiate and the blood lineages. So this screen again was pretty simple, a CD34, CD133 positive screen. We carried out the screen, went through the whole collection and found molecules that actually expand HSCs in an undifferentiated state. Um, they work far better than HDAC inhibitors. You can actually expand these for 21 days, okay? Um, we then went back and took those expanded human HSCs and put them into non-skid mice and actually, you can repopulate non-skid mice. Um, we, this is actually one of the first experiments with 10 to the 6 cells, 10 to the 7 cells. You can repopulate non-skids pretty well. Um, and we've done colony forming assays, colostrum forming assays, and we do generate all progenitors. So um, this looks interesting. So then we went and talked to people who do bone marrow transplants and said, what would really change the way you do bone marrow? Transplants, and they said, well, what you really want to do is be able to expand cord blood HSC. So we just went in and isolated, tiny isolated um, CD34 plus HSCs from cord blood, and now we can expand these. So you see, we're out to 35 days expanding these, okay? And they expand very, very efficiently, and again, they differentiate into blood lineages. So we're now actually asking whether we can take cord blood HSCs ex vivo, expand them, and then use them therapeutically, which would be a way to really quickly generate large numbers of HSCs you can use for bone marrow transplants and a large number of diseases where you don't have nearly the problem with um, rejection that you do um, normally. So that was interesting. We said, okay, so we're expanding, we can expand. Um, embryonic stem cells and adult stem cells, why don't we just take terminally differentiated cells and ask whether we can just proliferate those. So don't even worry about controlling um, um, different, the differentiation process. Just take the cells that you'd like to expand, whether they're dopaminergic neurons or modern neurons or whatever, and just make more. And so we set up a screen to do that. And uh, at the time, I was called by the JDRF. For some reason, they wanted me as in the advisory group to um, the JDRF, which I offered to do. But I started learning a little about type 1 diabetes. So we said, well, why don't we just do a beta cell proliferation assay? And the real problem here is when we looked into it, we couldn't get our hands on enough beta cells to do a screen. You know, you're talking about a billion cells, 10 billion cells to screen, 2 million compounds, OK? Because you're at 500,000 cells per well. So um, the trick we did is we did this reversible immortalization with large candidate. Um, and so we took beta cells, um, reversibly expanded those in the presence of doxycycline. Okay, you get an expanded population, you take dox away, and now you have your screening set. Now they may not be actually beta cells, but they're a pretty good primary screen. So we did a massive screen and we found molecules that would proliferate these, and you can make sure that they're not doxycyclomimetic simply by reversing it with a dox off versus dox on screen. And so we began to find these small molecules, and lo and behold, we found, you know, four ball. You expect to find four ball. It's a proliferative cancer causing molecule. We found a novel went agonist. Um, so went agonist work at the same time the paper came out. Right after we found this, it said bio um, will proliferate beta cells in vitro. And we found a lot of other interesting small molecules um, that we don't know the mechanism of action. Interestingly, we found this L type calcium channel agonist. It turns out one of these had been in people 20 years ago 
for psychiatric disease. So these have actually been in people. So the idea that you're going to use a proliferative molecule to expand beta cells in vivo and give somebody cancer is the fear of that's diminished because this has been in people. And so we actually did, took our first shot at an SDZ model where we would blade the beta cells. We probably did too high a level of SDZ. We have bladed 90 to 95% of the beta cells. But you can see as we begin to dose with an analog of this molecule, glucose is starting to come down. So we got pretty excited about this. And so we actually did histology on these mice, and we actually see a proliferated beta cell population. So in the first experiment, this looks actually really interesting. Um, now we have to go back and run better models, and we're collaborating with Yuval Dorr's lab and using his model and other models as well. Um, but I think this approach could be interesting, and maybe a book of goal we'd love to do take and make a population of motor neurons or dopaminergic neurons or cholinergic neurons to actually ask whether we can directly expand those as well, or hepatocytes or cardiomyocytes. So I think this could be an interesting approach for the regenerative therapy. So then a few years back, probably 10 or 15 years ago, we got interested in the idea of uh, can you actually carry out reprogramming. And we thought about this, and finally, um, uh, Shen Deng and Susanna Chen and I ran the screen, um, where we actually didn't know quite how to do this at the time. So what we did was a phenotypic screen, where we took mild blasts, which normally in the presence of DNA, DMSO will differentiate under these conditions in the myotubes. And so we took this molecule and screened a collection of molecules with the idea that we really didn't know what the marker here would be. But if we did go back, if we did reprogram, then we could differentiate these in osteoblasts or diposites under osteogenesis or diposites conditions. So the idea is screen, withdraw the molecule, and add these reagents. And in fact, we found a molecule we call reversin that will allow you to go through here, reprogram, and then make osteoblasts or make adipocytes. And these work at a clonal level, so we're not just selectively killing cells. And again, in this case, the affinity experiments confirmed by Biacores say we're binding two things, MEK12 and non-muscle myosin 2. And again, we confirm that with SIs and SHRNAs that hit both targets. Again, with a small molecule. So this molecule is kind of our first step into this. So we all we really know now is we're modulating the activities of these of these um, molecules. We're not sure whether you know, there's cell cycle effects, clearly. Um, what else is being affected, whether they're, you know, the DNA methylation status is being affected and so forth, um, we're looking at. Um, but we've begun to ask whether we can generalize this, so we went into another system where there was another example of, of plasticity by conduit at all, and, and um, that's in the case of ligand endocyte precursor cells, LPCs. And here we set up a screen now so that we can take OPCs and actually reprogram them such that we can make neurons instead of oligodendrocytes. And so we set up a screen here, um, and the screen wants to go backwards to a neural stem cell, uh, neural stem like cells using um, a SOX2 GFP reporter. And then we carry out the screen. And then we add neuron inducing conditions. And so here's a screen. We carry out transdome molecules. Um, they actually upregulate um, the SOX2 promoter, and then you can actually form neurons. And all eight molecules we identified were HDAC inhibitors. So that may not be surprising. So the, here they are, they're HDAC inhibitors. Um, you can see when you treat. Um, the OPCs with these inhibitors, you actually get down regulation of OPC lineage markers and up regulation of NSC lineage markers. And if you do a chip analysis, um, you actually see changes in the R1 focus of the SOX2 promoter that you know, are consistent with the three programming. So now, um, where we're really going is to run many massive screens looking for molecules that reprogram HSCs um, um, and various um, 
So many of these derived from HSCs because it's a pretty defined system. Um, and we've also set up a collaboration with the Yanish lab where we're taking maps um, with a nanon luciferase reporters. And then we introduce OC4 and then pairwise, com uh, then we introduce pairwise combinations of OC4 and SOX2 or OC4 and KLF4 and look for replacements. So one strategy is to march backwards where you take all four factors that are required in forming IPS cells and delete one or two at a time and see whether you can make up for those with a small molecule. And so we've done, we've done screens of a hundred to two, of a million to two million molecules with probably five combinations right now and we're working through the data. But here's one where we took OC4 and SOX, just these two, and added these two classes of molecules and you can see you're actually forming what look like IPS cells. So here's a mess, the negative control, and here you have C's. And so these are what these two molecules do. So, you know, we may be able to now have a molecule that replaces KLF4 and MEC. Um, and as I said, we're taking all possible combinations, singles, doubles, and triples. So this is the direction we're headed in in this case. So I think maybe ultimately, hopefully, we can find chemical factors that do this. So you can also have fun with this. So um, I was sitting around talking to a colleague of mine, um, Arden Papushin, and Arden has cloned the hot and cold receptors. Okay, so the cold receptor are these trip channels. And so, you know, he has channels that are sensitive to, uh, sensitive to various temperatures and it's characterized in a lot of characterization. So Artem and I said, you know what? We had to just screen for small molecules that activate the cold, okay? And so we just started screening a million molecules. And the idea is, think about it, we get a molecule, what you want is something that turns on cold that's absolutely odorless and tasteless, okay? That's not really um, uh, systemically, um, there's no systemic exposure when you swallow it. Because then you can go out on your boat or go to the ball game and take a can of beer and just add a little bit of this molecule, like a spark tank, and you'll have a cold drink, okay? So forget ice, okay? You know? And maybe in Wisconsin, you can actually do the same thing with a hot receptor and put it in your clothes in wintertime, okay? And on warm clothes. So we're doing things like this, which could be kind of fun and ultimately pay the bill. Um, we're also, as I said, starting to use these tools now. Um, Big Pharma and Biotech have looked at major diseases, um, but a lot of orphan diseases have not been really looked at from a research to translation effort. So we began to set up, we're actually setting up an institute to look at uh, orphan and neglected diseases. And so, um, and really apply these tools to these diseases that we're learning a lot about the genetics, RET, and, you know, SMA and so forth and so on. But here with um, uh, Elizabeth Wensler, we did a screen of malaria. So we just took malaria and we did a red cell invasion screen. So proliferation screen in red blood cells. First time it's been done, we actually did it on a few million molecules. And we actually went through, and we have a database now, a GNF, where we have 300 cell-based screens across 2 million molecules. So if you get a hit, you can go through here, and here are all the screens, and here are the hits. These are the molecules. Look, this molecule, whoa, it does nothing, but it hits in malaria. It hits Jack 2 just a little. So all of a sudden, we have a huge collection of molecules that we can just go through and add to. So we have molecules that just hit malaria. And so we put together a collection of 5,000 or 6,000 confirmed cell-based hits that we're proposing now at the Gates Foundation to distribute to the whole academic community. And we're, we've done the same thing with tuberculosis and uh, Lichmanii and other diseases. We've also begun to look for endogenous small molecules that affect developmental pathways. So instead of looking for synthetics, Let's just go in and, and look at endogenous small molecules. So we have a corner on the fetal pig market in Indiana, okay? And we're grinding up fetal pig organs and screening those for molecules that will modulate these uh, um, uh, uh, processes, either differentiation, self-renewal. 
And so we found now molecules that actually um, uh, will act, um, activate, um, we found both agonists and antagonists for hedgehog signaling that are endogenous small molecules. And now we're trying to sort out their structures. Um, we think one of these is a family, uh, molecule in a steroid family. We've also, at GNF now, um, kind of had the idea, let's go back. Um, and we built a lot of tools. Let's just go back now and look at proteins and peptides that affect the melanoma pathways and other pathways. So, you know, people have looked at secreted peptides and proteins before. They're about 4,000. And only about 15% of the characterized. So we actually said, can we actually go into this set of 4,000? Express and purify all 4,000. And take purified proteins and then run them through cell based assays. Now, with our automated cell based profiling system, we can run about 100 to 200 assays at a time. So we thought that would work. And so we're also doing this with conditioned media. But so we took 700 genes that we want to do this year, and we didn't know, you know how you express, clone express, purify, and assay 700 proteins. In the mammalian cells. So again, we took the engineering group at GNF, and together with Scott Leslie and others, um, we actually built this automated pure, uh, protein expression purification system, where this system will automatically grow up mammalian or insect cells up to 400 cells at a time, the distinct expression constructs at a time. Um, we can do this transient or viral expression. We grow up, we isolate roughly a milligram of protein per expression construct, and we automatically lyse, if these are his tags, centrifuge lyse, affinity, purify, run these through a series of biophysical and biochemical assays to look for integrity, homogeneity, and so forth and so on. So we built this system, essentially impressive in person. And we took a set of 48 proteins, okay, Half chosen at random and half is kind of controls. And of the 48, the first pass through, we make both N and C terminal fusions, the various um, fusion constructs as tags, or um, FC fusions. We ran these through, and 75% actually gave purified, act isolated protein that you could isolate and was active in the first round pass, 75%. So we were, we thought it might be 10%. So we're pretty excited. So if you take that number and apply it to 4,000, it's 3,000. So, and if you run these through a panel of assays, we have now 100 assays that we're assaying these proteins. Again, here, oh, well, here's um, glucagon. OK, here's PCSK9. OK, here's IL-8. And they're all coming up exactly where you would expect them to come up. So we, now what we want to do is take this collection now and also look at reprogramming with this collection of proteins to see whether we can get a combination of pure health proteins that we can do reprogramming or even self-renewal with. Now, um, small molecules are neat. And if you find something, you can potentially test it in vivo, but it's the hard way to find novel genes. So if you're just interested in finding novel genes, as much as people talk about chemical genetics, chemical genetics is harder than hell, OK? compared to genetics. So what you should do is just take SI RNA libraries, lengthy viral libraries, transfection libraries, cDNA libraries, and screen these. We think this is a lot easier. So at GNF, um, we built these large collections. Tony Orth and Jeremy Caldwell and others have built these huge collections of array SI and cDNA. By the way, we have these collections available to academic collaborators and also small molecule collections. And so this is where we're going to in reprogramming and differentiation, where we're screening these collections of SIs and CDNAs. So here we're looking at methylation status, both from a cancer and reprogramming perspective. So we built uh, P16 and IC4 reporter-based screens looking at demethylation. And so the readout is a luciferase readout. And we're doing these screens now with small molecules, siRNAs, and CDNAs. And so Here's the first round of the cDNA library. So here's uh, the control GAD 45A. And these are the first set of genes that have come out, including this RNF4, which looks like it might be interesting. And since we actually isolated 
things that appear to be even more interesting than GAD45. You can also use the same approach to look for um, non-coding RNAs that modulate processes. So we went in and with John Hoganich, we made a collection of, um, of siRNAs that targeted 512 conserved non-coding RNAs using them. And mouse, these are, are larger non-coding RNAs. And so you can just make these SI libraries and screen them. And here we found molecules that affect hedgehog signaling and also not coding RNAs that affected um, uh, infant signaling. And um, the guy who made a mistake of calling these non coding RNA repressors of infant signaling, which turned out to be Enron, okay? <laughs> um, but this is a real result. Um, so it turns out the, this non coding RNA appears to be a repressor of infant signaling. And if you look at Enron expression, it's in lymphoid cells. If you look at the expression, um, 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 tissue expression um, tables. Um, we actually did pull down, so we made this non coding RNA and put it on an affinity support. And we actually pulled down important data and some other proteins that showed actually that Enron actually interacts with this important data and protects it in an RNA protection experiment. And the knockdown of this actually increases nuclear infant levels. So the current model, and it's specific for infant, so the current model here is, is we think this non-coding RNA actually is a modulator of nu nuclear trafficking and perhaps can, can confer specificity. And so um, the final is, is we went further and said, oh, guys, yeah. Why don't we just randomly mutate mice and look for interesting phenotypes? And so, you know, Chris Good now at the time was doing this and others. So Steve Kay and myself and Colin Fletcher and uh, others got together and we said, could we do this? And so we did it on a pretty massive scale of GNF. And uh, this is a recessive screen. So we breed out the teen you need a genesis. The G3s, and then we ran these things for a huge number of assays. So we have mice that have no T cells, G cells, you know, altered, you know, LDL levels, and so on and so on. We have a mouse that I come up with these weird screens. So I said, because as a chemist, you can come up with weird stuff. Because biologists don't think you're a fool, they just think you're naive, okay? So it's, it's nice. You can have really silly things. Um, so I said, let's feed the mice McDonald's french fries <laughs> and look for mice that get thinner, okay? And we found a mouse um, that gains muscle mass and loses weight, we call it Arnie, okay? <laughs> and so we're mapping those genes. But I, you know, I went over to, to Rusty and I said, look, how do we screen these mice for regenerative phenotype? And he said, oh, do a spinal cord and hemisection. And I'm like, Rusty, we're doing 200 mice a week, what are you talking about, okay? So, I said, like, come on. I said, hey, Rusty, how about we just give them earring holes, okay? And he said, that'll work. So what we did is we punched holes in these, all the mice here, 200 per week, and just looked at a wound healing phenotype. And we actually have this mouse that has a wound healing phenotype, but there's actually more than wound healing. There's car um, cartilage, there are blood vessels, there are hair follicles, okay? So it almost looks like a regenerative phenotype. And so we've actually sequenced the mutation and matched the TGF um, beta R1. And it's not a constituent active or, 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 or inhibited, it's, it's kind of a kinetic mutation and a signaling pathway. Um, and we've actually mapped the mutation. So we're actually characterizing these mice now in more detail, looking at chondrogenesis in these mice, looking at immune system function, and so forth and so on, and looking for other phenotypes, for instance, heart. Um, regeneration and so on and so on. This, so this kind of thing. And then finally, you can go all the way with this idea. So, you know, biology solves problems by, you know, making many possible solutions and simply selecting the best one. So one day I was sitting in a meeting with a bunch of physicists, and I said, how come all you guys are working on buckyballs? I know, whole physics community is working on these things. And the answer was, is they didn't know how to make anything more interesting. Okay, so that was the only game in town. So, and the reason is, is if you begin to look at the materials of these really 
complex materials with all these elements five at a time. And theory is absolutely useless in advanced material properties. So I said, wow, we could find interesting things by just doing what the immune system does. Make huge libraries. Work for immune system, it works for small molecules, maybe it'll work for elements. So I was watching my son at the time, crayon, and he had these stencils here. So he had a stencil where these are plastic and they're half blocked here. And so you have a blue crayon and he paints a little blue here. If you rotate the stencil and get a yellow crayon, you get yellow, you get orange, you get red. So then if you take all the stencils off, you get all combinations of the colors, right? So all we did was replace the, the stencils with metal mass and the crayons with laser bladed metal oxides, okay? And you can make this library of phosphors, thousands at a time, okay? And you want a blue phosphor? Here's a new blue phosphor. Okay, right there. Okay, so all of a sudden you can begin to make any kinds of materials this way. We actually, Henry Weinberg and his group really took this to town. People have made all kinds of new things. So now we're applying this back and actually getting back the materials and we're trying to make hydrogen storage materials and uh, lithium silicon 10 negative electro batteries for lithium ion batteries that kind of solve the energy problem. Um, so, or at least, you know. Great shot. So, um, that's the story, okay, of the last two days is, you know, what chemists do better than anybody is make interesting new structures. But, and what we really like to do with chemistry over the next 10 or 100 years is make really interesting new properties and do so in a rational way. And so our kind of approach and philosophy is really to look how nature made these interesting molecules and the strategies nature used combine that with chemistry, and then apply it to a huge number of interesting problems, chemistry, biology, and the physical sciences. And again, I tried to point out the people that did the work. OK, again, the work was done by, this is my current group. Um, and uh, these are the collaborators, especially I like to point out Shu Wu, Charles Cho, who right now are we're doing really extensive collaborations with the at GNF and have also appointments at TSRI. And again, all the work was done by a bunch of really terrific people that I've really been privileged to work with. And again, I've had a terrific time here, and thank you for your attention.